Hello, Patricia Arquette. You don't really need an introduction. So I have the, you know, I had many words to say, but actually you don't. You have an NGO. You focus a lot of your energy on climate change and women. And a lot of people here and a lot of people watching us will not know the link between the two. Why is that your focus? Yes, so my NGO is called givelove.org and we do uh, ecological sanitation in the developing world. A lot of people don't think, you know, that sanitation really crosses many sectors that impact women. I do women's rights, I work on women's rights in America, I work on equal pay in America, and in the developing world I work on improved sanitation. And part of the re reason is because many women, girls drop out of school because they don't have facilities to go to the bathroom. Uh, they don't have places to deal with their menstrual flow. Women don't have security because they're being sexually assaulted because they have to go to community toilets. Many women say they can't even go to the bathroom at night. Uh, last, our last trip, an elderly woman, we, we uh, piloted a household pilot a toilet and she had it and she said, now I don't have to go outside. This is in the middle of a minata in the middle of nowhere. Now I don't have to go outside the stick uh, fence where I can get hit on the head and raped at night. And I'm looking at her and thinking, she's 70 years old. When do you get to stop worrying about being raped? When does that day come? So the crossover between climate change and sanitation is as we see climate change come. We know that women, uh, the majority of women, say in Africa, uh, 75 to 90% of the, of the agriculture work is done by women. And they have to also collect the firewood and the, the fuel for fire. They also have to collect the water. As water dries up, these resources come further and further away from them. Um, the lack of sanitation is the number one pollutant to water. So as we look at climate change and having less water, we're going to also be looking at the impact on the water sources we do have. So when women are going to have to go further and further. And a lot of people don't know that the mega slums that we find all around the world are built on floodplains. And intentionally. There's a reason the rich people aren't claiming that land back. It's because it's all floodplain. So when you have torrential rains and this, this, these different cycles of, of weather patterns that we're seeing that are very unstable, uh, obviously women are going to be impacted uh, in these mega slums. And most yeah. people don't know that, that even in disasters, women have a higher rate of dying from hurricanes, from flooding. Now, in certain areas where you're economically equal, uh, where women can have an education, where women do own property, things like that, it's more equal, the males and females that die. But in much of the world, more women die from climate activity even today than they will in the future. And we know food insecurity is a breeding ground for uh, sexual trafficking. And this is going to be another problem. So part of my NGO, what we do, we improve sanitation, we protect water resources, we help girls stay in school, and we end up with uh, compost so you can amend soil. These are agriculture people. You know, if you amend the soil, the water you get, you can maintain. You can draw down carbon, which is part of what we need to do for climate change. So that's why I'm very passionate about this, how these things overlap one another and impact one another. But so if a woman is empowered economically, is she a, a better force of good? Is she a, a stronger force of change within her community, including you know, these agricultural supply chains that you're talking about, but also household spending and behavior within the society? Well, women do three quarters of the non-paid work. And so the more empowered the woman is, obviously those around her are. And, and the safer choices that she gets to make. Uh, you know, it's very difficult when, when you have no, when you have no standing, when your society will give you no standing whatsoever. You may need to go to the doctor, but if somebody doesn't say, yeah, you, you can spend some of our money on you going to the doctor, you're not going. It's not going to happen for you. And it's really, really heartbreaking the situation women are in. 
it, how, how do you change that? So through your NGO, but how do people, do people need to lobby governments? Do people need to lobby their companies to do more? Well, I have to say, like looking at NGOs since I've been in this sector since 2010, the first thing I started to see was all of a sudden business, and I'm going to call BS on this, everyone. Everyone, uh, the aid model started to go to, hey, what's the business going to be? How's this going to be sustainable? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when I'm looking at a woman who has to feed one of her kids on Monday, that one on Tuesday, that one on Wednesday, that one gets fed again on Thursday, she doesn't have money for these things. We're, we're using our, our aid money as a country to put into health care. Three, qu three quarters of all hospital beds in Africa are diarrheal diseases. Kids are getting sick from dirty water, but we have no sanitation. We're spending the money, but we're spending it in all different places and, and not as well as we could. Then we're expecting this lady to somehow have extra money to pay for clean water, buy water and, and sanitation. It's just not realistic. Then I saw the aid world change to what it is today. Aid groups, big aid groups, all the money's drawing up, and now they're saying, governments, you need to do it. And yeah, it's true. There's been a lot of malfeasance, and governments aren't doing their part. But still, at the end of the day, I look at this woman, I look at this kid, and somebody's got to help. It, it is, these are human beings, and they're valuable, and they're beautiful human beings. I mean, one of our things that we do with our project, we worked at Standing Rock. The Sioux Tribe brought us in. <clears throat> we worked the, with the YU Tribe in South America. We work with tribes and original peoples around the world that have high infant mortality rates. It's important that these people survive. It is important that these cultures survive. These traditional, original people survive. And you know, as the governments, we're also seeing land grabs. Traditional people who used to move, uh, now when they leave, their ancestral land's being taken for mining. So, so many things are coming all at once on people. So are, are we <clears throat> becoming more responsible as, <clears throat> as a world or less responsible? Because we talk <clears throat> about it, there are conferences like this focusing on climate change and on women rights. Is it making a difference? Well, I'm glad we're all talking about it, but I think we have to address it in multiple ways. Obviously, I think that it's completely unhelpful that the United States right now is pulling out of climate change accords, that we have a president that's in denial, that we have half the country pretending this is junk science. That's not helpful. Um, but I think we need to do a lot of things, and I do think we have to look at our agricultural practices, because part of it is also monocropping, uh, depleting our soils, not looking at, you know, if we're drawing down carbon, which is part of the answer, less emissions, you know, putting, uh, but also improving our soils because then we could draw down the carbon and then it goes into the root system, into right. hummus, and we can pull some of it back out. I mean, I, I've been doing some research, and it, it's clear that gender equality or, or women, when women are empowered, especially in developing societies, it actually has a multiplier effect on some of these SDGs. Yeah. So do people realize, do, again, organizations realize that that's kind of the source where you need to go? Have you had support for your NGO? Well, what we do is often we work with uh, smaller and large-scale NGOs. We work with Water Aid in South America. and beekeeping women's group and then we work with like basket weavers and dancers in in Kenya so we work with schools NGOs that have multiple schools we work with groups that have at-risk people we're doing a pilot in a mega slum in Uganda um, because all of these things are important and mega slums there's gonna be uh, I think in the next 40 years half, more than half the world's population are gonna be living in mega slums you've always advocated women's rights and equal rights. Where does that come from? When did you realize that this was, you know, that something needed to change? You know, I didn't grow up really hearing the word feminist that much. My, my friend's mom did work at a place called uh, a, a Feminist Women's Health Center. So I heard it, but it was sort of like, what's that word? What is a feminist? I don't know. It wasn't really something I, uh, my mom was very traditional in many ways. But I did see my mom's powerlessness, you know? 
there was a time where my mom and dad were going to get divorced, and my mom had breast cancer. And at that time, and we're about to revisit that time possibly, <coughs> after, uh, I don't know, 27, 28, maybe 30 years of marriage and five kids, she said, you know what, I can't divorce your dad because I won't have health care and I have breast cancer and I'll be uninsurable. And it was like, oh my God, you know, you were his partner and you were a big part of his whole life, but society, you were invisible the next day. They will drop you and you, you've done nothing your whole life as far as society is concerned. And so that, that was one of my, my lessons. Also, I was a single mom when I was 19. So, and I had to give up job opportunities where, where, I, where I definitely experienced some, what I felt was unfair kind of um, expectations on me as a woman. Is it, is it what discrimination or? Um, I I weirdly I had to walk away from two work experiences because one because I was pregnant and I didn't know how my pregnancy would be impacted by worrying about gaining weight on a movie and also doing a very physical getting like beaten and raped kind of scene I didn't want to go through that while I was pregnant. So I didn't know if I'd really have a career. And then my next job, after I had my, my son, this director just wanted me to sign something saying I would just be naked and do whatever he wanted. And I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, really, I'm a professional. You're a professional. You're a director. You know what you want to see. What's the idea here? Like, can't we talk through a scene? No, I just want you to sign something. Yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and that was hard, because I really didn't know where I was buying diapers. So it was like, uh, I, why do I feel like you're not dealing with me like a professional person? Well, now, the last thing I had to be naked in, they break everything down now. <laughs> oh, it's different world now. <laughs> you you yeah. gave uh, an amazing speech five years ago. Did, did, did the conversation change? When you, when you had that acceptance speech, did you get support? Did people say, gosh, I wish I did that? Well, it was right, really so scary. It was really scary because I knew it was like the subconscious thing that you're, unspoken thing, you're not supposed to be political. But, you know, I was winning this award for this woman whose life could have been really different. She was the primary breadwinner for these kids and caretaker had she made a full dollar. Um, so I knew I wanted to do that. But great things came of it. Salesforce did a gender audit because two of the women from Salesforce saw that speak. It's, speech and went into Mark Benioff and said, hey, are we getting paid for early? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm sure you guys are. Are you really sure? <laughs> well, let's do a gender audit. Great. Well, they find, oh, surprise, $3 million, you know, gender discrepancy. And they fixed that. Then they went back the next year and did a gender and race audit. Up, oh, another $3 million bucks. Fix that. That's incredible. And Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, she said, I've been presenting this, this this um, bill for 36 years. But once you said that, I threw it on the floor, it passed. And then 41 other laws passed across the states, sister bills. There's still a long way to go. But business, like with Salesforce doing that, he called, uh, Mark Benioff called on all these other companies. They signed up to be gender partners to do pay audits and to make up discrepancies. And that's a wonderful way to go. And it's an easy thing for, you know, he says himself, any CEO can get it done like that. I mean, really, you go to accounting, they, it's barely any work for them to figure it all out. Um, so ideally, it should come from companies, I think, because it's the right way to treat your employees and from the employees pressuring the companies. But even Iceland, which has been committed to equal pay more than any other government and has had laws on the books for decades, they said at this point, if you, you have to do a gender audit, and if you find a discrepancy, we are going to, and you don't fix it in a short period of time, we will penalize you. And I think that's where we have to get to, because many companies don't want to do it. Did, did you get backlash after that speech? Did you almost not make that speech? Well, I got some backlash, but I would have not not made that speech because the, I wanted to help people and I 
was part of something where all these activists had been doing this work forever. It wasn't like, I did this. No, but I just opened the door for the activists and the leaders and the lawmakers to be heard and the employees to be heard a little more. So I got to be a part of something that's meaningful to me. You, you testified two <coughs> weeks ago in the US Congress <coughs> in support of the Equal Rights Amendment. Why do we need to do that in 2019? <clears throat> hmm, what a question. <laughs> um, well, yes. So the Equal Rights Amendment, you know, when the Justice Scalia, a recent Supreme Court justice, said certainly the Constitution doesn't require discrimination on the basis of sex. The question is whether it prohibits it. It doesn't. So if you have a Supreme Court justice like him, they interpret the Constitution from the time it was written. The time it was written, black women were slaves, and, and white women were considered the chattel or property of their husband or their father. So he's not lying when he says that's how he interprets the Constitution and will make legal decisions from his concept of the Constitution. So we're in dangerous territory when people don't think you're supposed to have equal rights. And we've seen that happen, actually. Part of the Violence Against Women Act was struck down when Christine Broncola tried to use it in um, campus assault rape cases. So I mean, when I started to look at all these different weird laws, oh, all 50 states had untested rape kits. Hmm. Is that because most of the victims are women? That's weird, don't you think? <laughs> There's no one's budgeting. To, to test evidentiary uh, kits for, for rape, that all of these hospitals don't even know how to collect evidence in a rape kit, even though it's such a common trauma that people go through. Seven states, women can be forced to co-parent with their convicted rapists. We now have new laws passing just yesterday, uh, anti-abortion laws, uh, you know, including People who are incested and, rape, and raped. I mean, there's no protections in certain states. They want to get this to the Supreme Court. They want to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, and they don't want the Equal Rights Amendment to pass because they're afraid that we give women more grounds to have rights to abortion because they would be false people. That's the truth. That's what they're afraid of. So is it getting worse in the US? At the same time, you have a record number of female representatives in Congress. Yeah, and that's wonderful. Well, and that very helps. exciting. And we have some very strong candidates running for president now, too, who are women. Um, does that help? Yes, it helps. I think it is helpful. Um, what would you change if you had to change one thing right now in the US or, or on how women, I don't know if it was. <laughs> Oh boy! I didn't you say know, one it's person. Like that genie <laughs> thing. Like you have three wishes. Okay, one. Okay, I wish one. for more wishes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't is know. It, is, Can is I there a magic? One? Is there something? So that... many things. I mean, I guess. Okay. I, in this conversation, I would say you know, to deal with all civil rights issues in America, <laughs> make everything really just and fair. Who's getting it right? Is there, a, is there a part of the world? Is there someone, is there one person <clears throat> that you look up to? Well, for equal pay, I really like the leadership of Iceland. I mean, they're really, really committed to being the first nation on earth that pay women equally. And I think that's a really important, powerful thing. Have you ever had to pay for or fight for your pay? Or if I've walked away from jobs. Weirdly, I never really thought of my own equal pay before I gave that. Because I always just felt like, I'm so lucky, I'm an actor, oh my god, I'm living the dream, I can't believe it. Now, for years I'd heard this subconscious kind of thing, well, they gotta hire the guy first. Well, there's no money left because they paid the guy, you know. But that was kind of normal, like, I had really internalized, like, that was just normal the way it is, you know. I mean, even on recent jobs, you know, that was the situation. Uh, Has it changed now? Has something changed in you? <laughs> Has anything changed? Has anything not changed? Not so much. I mean, not, <laughs> honestly, I, like, I was on, we had a whole different cast for Escape at Dan Amora, but then the guy dropped out. 
so the move, the whole thing almost fell apart. Didn't matter that I was the lead, and it didn't matter that I'd won an Oscar. Didn't matter that I was already there. I still needed to wait for a guy, the guy, with, and then the guy got paid twice what I got paid. And I'm not mad at him, but I mean, it, it doesn't matter. If I had a TV show that was on 18 million people watching every week, right? Can you imagine if that was a movie showing and you had 18 million people per viewing? That would be the biggest box office movie on earth. Well, not on earth, okay, but yeah. you know what I'm saying. It would be a huge hit. So I don't know who's modulating these things or deciding what value is. It's kind of crazy, but yeah. I still feel very lucky and I feel, still feel grateful, but. Um, Have you ever had a, a male actress say, look, by the way, I'm sorry, or or you know, is it up to to the guys? I, I really to say? weirdly don't really blame the guys. I think it's more about agents, because I and I've said that to my whole agency. All you guys need to get it together. You have internalized this subconscious thing, and you have not been working hard enough for your female clients. I mean, you know, it happened with the Michelle Williams situation, right? He was paid like. 1,500 times more than her, right, for these reshoots. They had the same agency. What's going on here? <laughs> what is happening here? So, yeah, I mean, I think we're all, I know I was raised with a lot of internalized misogyny or internalized sort of the way things are. Like the status quo was just a part of my understanding. What, what advice do you give to your kids on this? You, uh, you know what, I think somebody had said to me once, you're, she had five kids, she said, this one is nothing like this one. So I think you have to be a linguist to be a parent. You know, my advice for my son is totally different than my advice for my daughter. I think not so much for their gender, although I catch myself you know, being sexist all the time with them. Um, but more who they are as people, you know. What's your strength? Hey, to my daughter, I'm like, you shouldn't be as hard on yourself. And my son, I'm like, you need to be a little harder on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, Patricia Arquette, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given and how to deal with either inequality or, or gender issues or anything that's just unjust? You know, my mom used to say to me all the time, First thing in the morning when you get up, before you get out of bed or do anything, just close your eyes and get quiet and ask God, who is Patricia? Like, ask who your own self is. Feel your own self. And the quality of your nature, what is that? And I think because my mom kind of raised me and all of us to kind of be connected to who we are, that guided me to have my own voice. You know, so I think my mom, you know, was my greatest uh, teacher. Patricia Arquette, thank you so much. Thank you.